to welcome everyone to the 63rd Annual Cardinal Spellman Shakespeare Contest. And yes, I've been here for every one of them. Okay. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, thanks so much for supporting Spellman and Shakespeare and the kids. They really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, please, if you have to leave at any time, please wait till the contestant is finished with their monologue. Then you may leave, if you have to leave. Okay? The schedule for the day is this. Uh, the first thing we're going to present to you is the 24 student monologues, the 24 finalists out of some 50 people who auditioned. Uh, then, something new this year, uh, five of the seniors are going to rap a Shakespeare song, which should be good. And then we have six faculty members who have volunteered their time and their talents to do their favorite Shakespeare monologue. Let's hear it for these guys. And wait, see if the contestants are ready. Of course. Yes, please put your cell phones on silent. If they ring, one of the security people in the back will take your phone and take you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Ms. Walker. That's something I did forget. Okay, tell me if they are ready. And we're going to give a rousing cheer to the 2023 Shakespeare finalists. But they didn't hear you. That was good, though.
All right, the 24 contestants will be led in by Ms. Emily Lutchman, who today is performing the role of the Master of the Rebels. to work. Um, each contestant will come up and stand at the base of the stairs and Greenwood will announce the play from which the monologue is taken, the character, and a brief, brief, brief synopsis of what's kind of going on. Okay, so let's hit the lights. That was good, thank you. All right, just one quick thing before we begin. As the contestants come up, please don't yell, hey Meadow, hey this, because this is not Meadow, this is Ophelia. They are in character, help them stay in character. The play Hamlet. The death and secret burial of her father have driven Ophelia mad. Here she enters the presence of the king and queen. Rosemary, that's for remembrance. Pray you love, remember. Here's pansies, that's for thoughts. Here's fennel for you and columbines. 
Here's room for you, and here's some for me. We may call it the herb of grace on Sundays. You must wear your root of difference. There's a daisy. I'd give you some violets, but they were there all when my father died. They say he made a good end. And will he not come again? And will he not come again? No, no, he is dead. Go to thy death, but he never will come again. His beard was as white as snow. All flaxen was his paw. He is God, he is God, and we cry away, moan. God have mercy on his soul. <laughs> and of all Christian souls, I pray God. God be with you. The play, Cymbeline. After her husband is banished to Italy by her father, the king, Imogen is visited by an acquaintance of her husband. She seeks news of her beloved, but realizes his actual intent is to seduce her. the meaning of life and death. To be or not to be, that is the question. I it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of trouble by opposing and them. Die to sleep no more, but to sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished to die to sleep to sleep for chance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come? When we have shuffled off, this mortal coil must give us pause. But there is the respect that makes calamity of so unlike. For who will bear the whips and scorns of time? Thy oppressor is wrong, the proud man's consumed. The pangs of despised love, the laws delay, the insolence of office and scorns that patience merit to thine worthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bitter pot kill. Who would far down to pay to go 
slumps and sweats under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from who was born, no traveler returns, puzzles the wind, and makes us rather bear those ends than fly to others that we know not of. And thus conscience does make cowards of us all. Thus the native hue of resolution is sickly to away with the pale cast of thought and enterprises, a great pitch and movement. With this regard, great currents turn around and lose the name of action. The play, Julius Caesar. Cassius attempts to get Brutus to join the conspiracy to assassinate Caesar. Why, yes, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men, as sometimes, are masters of their fate. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are under Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounding more Summer Night's Dream. Two men who had previously loved her friend Hermia have suddenly, because of a magic potion, fallen in love with Helena. Here she chides both men, thinking that they are playing a cruel trick on her. Of Windsor. 
Mistress Paige reacts to a love letter from the rotund wannabe player, Sir John Falstaff. Love letters in the holiday time of my beauty, and am I not a subject for them? Let me see. What a hair of jewelry is this? <laughs> oh, wicked, wicked world! One that is well nine more to pieces with age to show himself a young gallant! What an unweighed behavior hath this one a stronger pick! With the devil's name? Out of my conversation that he dares in this manner to see me? Why, he hath not been thrice in my company! Hmm. What should I say to him? <laughs> Why is so frugal of my mirth? Heaven forgive me. Why, I'll exhibit a bill in the parliament for the putting down of men. <laughs> How shall we wrench on him? For revenge I will be as sure as his guts are made of puddings. <laughs> Merchant of Venus, Shylock, Shylock, a Jewish moneylender, has been approached by Antonio, who wants to borrow three thousand ducats, a considerable sum. Antonio, an anti-Semite, has both verbally and physically abused the moneylender in the past. Shylock replies, "You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog." and spit upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to them. You come to me and you say, Sh Sh Shylock, we don't have money. <laughs> you say so. You that did void your room upon my beard, and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Money is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say, half the dog money? <laughs> is it possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats? Or shall I bend low and in a bondman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this? Then, sir, you spat on me Wednesday last. Why <laughs> me such a day? Another time, you called me dog, and for these courtesies, I'll lend you thus much money! <laughs> <laughs> concerned about her husband's recent behavior, urges him to tell her what's going on. You have ungently, Brutus, stolen from my bed, and yesterday night at supper, you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across. When I asked you what the matter was, you looked upon me with ungentle looks. When I asked you further, you scratched your head and too impatiently stomped with your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you answered not. But with an angry wafter of your hand, gave sign for me to leave you. So I did. Fearing to strengthen, Fearing that, to strengthen that impatience which seemed too much enkindled within. And withal, hoping it was but an effect of humor. Hoping it was but an effect of humor, which hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat nor talk, nor sleep, and could it work so much upon your shape as it has prevailed on your condition, I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my lord, please make me acquainted with your cause of grief.
The play Henry IV, Part II. A ditzy barmaid is angry with the fat drunk Sir John Falstaff, who owes her money and has promised to marry her. Marry, if thou wert an honest man, thyself in the money too. Thou didst swear to me upon a parcel gilt goblet sitting in my dolphin chamber at a round table by a sea cold fire upon Wednesday in a week and week when the prince broke thy head for liking his father to a singing man of Windsor. Thou didst swear to me then, as I was washing thy wound, to make me, my lady, thy wife. <laughs> Canst thou deny it? Did not good wife Keach, the butcher's wife, come in then and call me gossip quickly? Coming in to borrow a mess of vinegar, telling us she had a good dish of prawns, whereby thou didst desire to eat some, whereby I told thee they were ill for a green wound. And didst thou know when she had gone downstairs, desire me to be no more so familiarity with such poor people? Sing ear along, they should call me madam. And didst thou not bid me fetch thee thirty shillings and kiss me? Oh, I put thee to thy book of deny it. Caesar, Portia, the wife, wife of Brutus, argues that she should be privy to her husband's secrets. I should not need, if you were gentle, Brutus. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, am I expected to know some secrets that I pertain to you? Am I, but as it were, in some sort or limitation, expected to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Brutus's harlot, not his wife. I grant, I am a woman, but with all a woman, Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant, I am a woman, but with all a woman well reputed, Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels. I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound here in the thigh. Can I bear this with patience and not my husband's secrets? The play, as you like it. Try as she might, Phoebe cannot get rid of her unwanted suitor, who has accused her of being more cruel than an executioner. <laughs> I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tellest me there is murder in mine eye. Tis pretty. Sure, and very probable, that eyes are the frailest and softest things, who shut their coward gates on enemies, should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now, I do frown on me with all my heart, and if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee now. <laughs> How if fit to swoon, why now? fall down, or if thou canst not, oh, for shame, for shame, lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Now show the wounds mine eye hath made in thee, 
Scratch thee, but with a pin, and there remains some scar of it. Lean upon a rush, the cicatrice and capable in pressure thy palms a moment keeps. But now mine eyes, which I have darted at thee, hurt thee not, nor I am sure there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. <laughs> A Midsummer Night's Dream. The bombastic bottom, prefer performing the role of pyramids, believes his love, Thisbe, has been slain by a lion. <laughs> but stay, whole spite. But mark, poor night, what dreadful dole is here. Eyes, do you see? How can it be? Oh, dainty duck, oh dear. <laughs> Thy mantle good. <laughs> now what stained with? Blood? <laughs> <laughs> approach, ye furies, approach, ye furies fell. Oh, fates, come, come, cut thread. And thrum, <laughs> quail, crush, conclude, and quell. Oh, wherefore in nature didst thou lion's frame? Since lion vile half here deflowered, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> that what that which was? No, which was the fairest day? That loved, <laughs> that liked, that lived, that looked with cheer. <laughs> Come, tears. Come, tears. <laughs> Sword and wound the path of pyramids. I that left path <laughs> where heart doth hop. Thus die I. Thus. <laughs> Thus. <laughs> Thus. <laughs> Who 
shall be true to us when we are so unsecret to ourselves. But though I loved you well, I knew you not. And yet, good faith, I wished myself a man. Or that we women had men's privilege of speaking first. Sweet, bid me hold my tongue. For in this rapture, I shall surely speak the thing that I shall repent. See, see, your silence, cunning in tumness from my weakness draws my very soul of counsel. Stop. The play, Romeo and Juliet. Friar Lawrence has just told Romeo the good news that his punishment for killing Tybalt is not death, but banishment. Tis torture and not mercy. Heaven is here where Juliet lives, and every cat and dog and little mouse Every unworthy thing live here in heaven and may look on her. But Romeo may not. More validity, more honorable state, more courtship lies in carrion flies than Romeo. They may seize upon the white wonder of Juliet's hand, stealing immortal blessings from her lips. Though in pure and vestal modesty, still blush, thinking their own kisses sin. But Romeo may not. He is banished. Flies may do this, but from this I must fly. They are free men, but I am banished. And sayest thou yet? Exile is not death. The play, as you like it. Try as she might, Phoebe cannot rid of her unwanted suitor, who has accused her of being more cruel than an executioner. Attempts to get Brutus to join the conspiracy to assassinate Caesar. Why are you mad? He just destroyed upon the narrow world like a colossus. While we, petty men, walk under his huge legs and peep out 
to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some times are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that need be sounded more than yours? Wait them together? Yours is as fair a name. Sound them, it doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them, it is as heavy. Conjure with them, Brutus. We'll start a spirit as soon as Caesar. Now in the names of all the gods at once. But one, what meat doth this our Caesar feed that he has grown so great? Age, thou art shamed. Henry VIII. The proud Queen Catherine responds to her husband's attempt to dissolve their marriage so that he can marry another woman. When was the hour I ever contradicted your desire? Or made it not mine too? Or which of your friends have I not strove to love, although I knew he were my enemy? What friend of mine, that had derived to him your anger, did I continue in my liking? Nay, gave notice he was from thence discharged. Sir, call to mind that I have been your wife in this obedience upward of twenty years, and have been blessed with many children by you. If in the course and process of this time you can report and prove it too against my honor ought, my bond to wedlock, or my love and duty against your sacred person, in God's name, turn me away. God's name, turn me away. Come on. And let thou foulest contempt. And let the foulest contempt shut door upon me. And so give me up to the sharpest kind of justice. <laughs> The play, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Helena debates the wisdom of telling the man she loves that the woman he loves has run away. rallies his outnumbered troops before a major battle against the French forces.
this day is called the Feast of Christian. He that lives this day and comes safe home will stand, will stand the tiptoes with this day's name and rouse him at the name of Christian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is Saint Christian. Then he will strip his sleeve and show his scars. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispin shall never go by. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. The play, Julius Caesar, Antony, speaking at Caesar's funeral, attempts to turn the Roman citizens against the conspirators who assassinated him. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept, ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet, Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Luper Hall, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? I speak not to disprove what Buddha spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Play, King Lear, asked by her father how much she loved him in order to get a large share of his kingdom, Cordelia is brutally honest. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more, no less. Good my lord. You have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties to you back as a right fit. Obey you, love you, and most honor you. Why have my sisters husbands if they say they love you all? Happily, when I shall wed, that Lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him, half my care, and half my duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters, to love my father at all.
the play, The Comedy of Errors. A wayward husband hits on his wife's sister. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sweet mistress, what your name is else I know not, nor by what wonders you do hit of mine. Less in your knowledge and your grace, you show not than our earth's wonder, more than earth than mine. Teach me, dear creature, how to think and speak, lay open to my earthly gross conceit, smothered in errors, feeble, shallow, weak, the folded meaning of your word's deceit. Against my soul's pure truth, why labor you to make you wander in an unknown field? Are you a god? Would you create me anew? <laughs> Transform me then, and to your power I'll yield. But if I am I, then I know that you could leave me sisters, no wife of mine, nor to her bed, no homage do I owe. Far more, far more, to you do I decline. Oh, train me not, sweet mermaid, with thy note to drown me in thy sister's flood of tears. Sing, siren, for thyself, and I will don't. <laughs> Play. Julius Caesar. Portia, concerned about her husband's recent behavior, urges him to tell her what's going on. analyzes the stages of a man's life. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women, merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, their acts being seven ages. At first, the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then, then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and his shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. Then. 
the lover. <laughs> Sigh like a furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistresses. Eyebrow. <laughs> then, then the soldier, full of strange oaths, bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. Then the justice, with his fair round belly and good cap and line, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and the slippered pantaloon, <laughs> with spectacles on nose, pouch at side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice. <laughs> Turning again towards a childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. The last scene of all is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans taste, sans eyes, sans everything. <laughs> <laughs> Say we have a hand for it. Oh, it's fantastic. something we've never done before. We're going to have five seniors, five seniors, I can count, perform a rap Shakespeare song. This is an actual song from Shakespeare. Take a three minute stretch and then 
we're going to have the faculty perform their favorite monologues. So take three, stretch about a little bit, don't go far. You want to hit the lights on the house? Thank you. Okay, three minutes, we'll be right back. Make your right first. Shall bring her forth 
this monstrous birth the world's light. <laughs> Next up, Ms. Morosi Garcia Pucatel, performing the king from all's well that ends well in Spanish. Coming. 
I know thee not, old man. <laughs>
faith. How foolish are our minds. If I do die before thee, for thee shroud me in one of those same sheets. When my mother had a maid called Barbary. She was in love, and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of Willow. An old thing twas, but it expressed her fortune, and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind. I've much to do but to go hang my head all at one side and sing it like poor Barbary. The poor soul sat sighing like a sycamore tree. Sing all the green willow. Her hand on her bosom, her head on her knee. Sing willow, willow, willow. The fresh streams ran by her and murmured her moans. Sing willow, willow, willow. Her salt tears ran from her and softened the stones. Only by these. Sing willow, willow, willow. Oh, for the high view will come anon. Sing all the green willow, must be my garland. Let nobody blame him, this scorn I approve. That's not next. Hark, who said the knocks? Okay, the judge is in a heavy trouble. Gee, I'm shocked. <laughs> so, what I'm going to do is I am going to deform. Oh. Yeah. 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 All right, what? The, the ladies are giving it not cards? Yeah. All right. You guys are voting now for the People's Choice Award. I'm going to give you my favorite stuff from Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 1. of the Apocalyptic Artists Ensemble, and somebody who's been working with us for more than three years, and who was gracious enough to invite us to perform at their fundraising gala in October, Miss Alice Rainier. consulted with most of the classical theaters of New York City, including Classic Stage Company, the Public Theater, Red Bull Theater Company, Classical Theater of Harlem. Uh, I know Shakespeare. <laughs> and after witnessing these performances today, I have to say, so do your students. That was incredible. <laughs> I feel it's important to acknowledge uh, the importance of what's happened here today. We live in a world where our half of our lives, our education, our entertainment takes place online. We've lost years of connection to a pandemic. 
We've endured collective trauma across the globe. And it's programs like this that have been proven to combat our addiction to technology and to heal communities. Events like this one have been proven not only to enhance students' academic achievement and confidence, but also foster their resilience and their sense of community. Uh, foster a sense that they have a place to call home. They learn to recognize themselves in their peers and also celebrate and value differences by inviting them to literally put themselves in someone else's shoes and speak on their behalf, by challenging them to embody complex texts and share their work with a room of their peers, they practice grace. Empathy is a skill that must be practiced. It takes immense courage to do this work, to see and be seen. Shakespeare often compared the world to a theater as we literally heard in Nico's speech, all the world's stage. His theater is literally called the Globe Theater. In the theater, we rehearse and imagine how the world could be and who we could be in it. We practice ensemble. We confront how our actions, and especially our words, create that world. Performers, I applaud you for breathing new life into the Bard's words, these plays that are older than our country and making them your own. I can see you as the leaders of tomorrow who think outside the box and care for each other like breathing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I also think it's really important that we applaud the teachers, the faculty, and the administrators who make programs like this possible for seeing the value they have in students' education. Students, will you join me in applauding Mr. Smith and your faculty? <laughs> Judges have returned, so maybe we can turn the house lights on. Okay, so now we are going to... By the way, I think this is the longest the judges have ever been out. Yes, you've seen it, of course. Fancy, am I too close to the mic? Huh? I knew you would say that. <laughs> okay. The first award we're going to present will be the People's Choice Award. Wait, no, no, you gotta bring those things up there. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, the contestants themselves have voted, and we're about to receive the results. After that, of course, every participant today received a lovely certificate, which of course is what? Pseudo craving. That is correct, and I hope you do. So, judges, have you uh, reached a verdict? Yes, sir. Did you tell me and I forgot? It was hand to cheese. Come on. Okay. Then we'll do it for you. I know myself not, old man. <laughs> Fine. Okay. Then we'll announce the winners first of the trophies, and then we will present the People's Choice Award. But before we do, I want to thank everybody who came here who showed respect for Shakespeare, for themselves, and for each other. I think it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Again, my favorite day of the year, even more favorite than the last day of school. <laughs> okay. 
So, we have three winners of trophies. Ladies, would you like to present the trophies? Sure. Well, you have a choice. Okay. Runners up. Antonio Rivera. Runner up. You have to stay there because somebody might want to take a picture. <laughs> Roll up, Sergio Prado. In the third place. Mr. Drew, with the camera, thank you. <laughs> and thank you to all the parents who came out here to support your kids. I, it's, it's, really, it's really too much, right? Y'all do so much for us, thank you so much. Yeah. Not finished. <laughs> and to all of those students who came out out of their busy days, to come here and support us, I appreciate y'all, truly. Thank you. Shakespeare! Hey, you can say the staff, our prompter, Audrey. 
Our announcer, by the way, both two-year starters. Yeah. The gentlemen players are hostesses. The judges and did anybody lose their wallet or watch? Do you know why? Because of security, Dave and John. Guys, thank you for making this easily the best day of the year. I thank the parents for sending us such wonderful people to work with. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Guys, you're all winners. Thank you. We are now. You may be